Jesus is alive. I am an ambassador of Christ. Often when we're growing up, we dream of traveling the world someday. We want to explore, see the sights, visit exotic locations and historic landmarks. We want adventure. We want to experience life beyond our own patch. However, to travel any further than the borders of your own country, you need a passport. This document is the way by which others identify you. It tells them who you are. It contains important information like your name, your place of birth, your nationality, as well as a photograph of you. Forget your passport and you're going nowhere. Exploring new places is fun. The different languages and accents, the foods and the climate, the means of travel and unique customs and cultures, as well as the stunning scenery and beautiful architecture. It can also be dangerous. Our unfamiliarity can get us lost, pickpocketed, or even cause us to become stranded or in trouble. Some of us travel for a vacation and soon return home. Others move away from home, sometimes for a season and sometimes permanently. And yet, wherever we are, we tend to carry with us an identity, a patriotism, an allegiance to a country, a flag, a family, or even just a way of living. It gives us a sense of security. Now rewind with me for a moment, and let's read the same story through God's lens, beginning with spiritual birth. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit breathed new life into your inner being. He also began to awaken dreams, passions and purposes in your heart. He placed in you new desires and longings, gifts and callings. And as a new creation, you've received a new passport. Your new name is Christian. Your family line is Jesus. Your citizenship is in heaven. And the image on your passport is stunning, photoshopped by Jesus himself, your perfect true self, sanctified and made whole in him. Exploring the world from this new vantage point is fun. We see people differently. We're progressively less judgmental and more compassionate. We're not weighed down by the temporary, the detours and the delays. Instead, we travel with eternal hope and everlasting peace. At the same time, we realize the dangers. The culture is peculiar to us, with snares that are foreign to our new way of life. People here live differently. Their values and goals often conflict with that of our homeland. And we recognize that getting lost could spell trouble. Thankfully, even in this season away from home, as Christ's ambassadors, we have been given a foreign embassy in the form of the local church. While on foreign soil, the church functions as a kind of safe haven, a sanctuary where we can connect with other compatriots and receive messages of encouragement and instruction from our kingdom home. As we strengthen our true identity, we are able to navigate the world and remain loyal to the king and his cause. Okay, let's take a moment to unpack this. The writer of Hebrews calls us aliens and strangers in this world. This is not our home, not Canada, not North America, not planet Earth even. We're only visiting. Our citizenship is in heaven. The Apostle Paul says that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He goes on to describe how God calls us out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is our conversion. This 
is our new birth, our new identity. No longer residents of a land in darkness, but those who live from a place of marvellous light. Our new identity can seem muddled. When we make ourselves too much at home here, we become too familiar, too comfortable, and too acclimatised with our surroundings. We put down roots, we clutter our lives with things, and we busy ourselves with activities that absorb away our time, money, and energy from kingdom exploits. In a parable about sowing seeds, Jesus warns us that the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of pursuing earthly riches and a desire for other things can choke out what Jesus has spoken over us. As Christians, it's important that we cultivate our identity as ambassadors, kingdom representatives who carry a message and a ministry. Consider some of the functions within God's embassy. Apostles. It means sent ones. Notice the word post in there. We are God's postmen and women sent out to deliver messages wherever we go. Next, prophets. A prophet is someone who receives a divine message for people. And what about evangelists? Again, Notice the word angel sandwiched in the middle. It means messenger. See, evangelism is simply sharing the message or the good news of Jesus Christ. It's critical that we don't overlook the role that we play in God's purposes. God is making his appeal through us. Peter affirms that we are a a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we may proclaim the excellencies of Christ, who called us out of darkness. God wants to be reconciled to people. As God's representatives, this is our ministry. This is our mission. Often we think of missionaries as those called to go to Africa or the Amazon jungle. And they are. But while geographical relocation can help establish that missionary mindset, you're no less a missionary in your own backyard. May you live free from the snares of this world and grow stronger and stronger in your God-given identity as an ambassador for Christ. May the hope that you have make you bold for the mission that lays before us. For this, you have been set apart. Hello, everybody. We are at set number four, and Dan has helped us uh, introduce our topic for today. I am an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So I have my resident theologians with me uh, again. Thank you for being with us. We're going to get right into it so uh, we can use our time wisely. I thought we would start with a couple of definitions because we're using two definitions that I don't think we use in normal language. One being ambassador and uh, one being reconciliation. And certainly reconciliation we don't use lots except in bookkeeping. I'm going to ask Jim and Monique uh, this question. To define ambassador, what's that mean? Well, uh, to summarize it very quickly, uh, I would say it's a high-ranking official representing a king or a kingdom. And if I'm a Christian, I represent Christ as my king, and my home is a kingdom where he lives. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm a representative for Jesus Christ. My life, 24-7, should be impacted by the power and presence of Christ Mm -hmm. in me and through me. My entire life is now to advertise Jesus and not one aspect of my life should be my own. Hmm. I belong to Christ. Mm -hmm. People may be thinking, oh, I don't want to belong to anybody. I want to be my own self. But I think we are created in God's image and God created us for himself to worship him. And we can only find true peace and true fulfillment 
if we realize that we belong to Christ and we're here to serve him. Again, another tangent, because you may be thinking it. <laughs> Interesting enough, when we talked about belonging, people who think that they don't belong to anybody actually belong to the enemy mm-hmm. of our souls. Mm-hmm. So you either belong to Satan or you belong to God. Mm-hmm. You don't belong to nobody. Everybody right. belongs to one or the other. Mm-hmm. Now, reconciliation, that, that's a, that has some significant biblical impact for us. So uh, a few few of you are going to help us with this. So uh, maybe start with uh, Jeff. Um, talk to us about reconciliation, what the, what the Bible means by that. Well, I think that in simple terms, it's, it's restoring of a relationship. So a, a bond that's uh, broken is now put back together. So um, I think us, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation uh, to share about it, to talk about it, because God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. So that's so okay. we can share about because you no, know, we have the bond reunited with God. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, <clears throat> I'll go quickly. I have three things. Um, so re- restoration of relationships. So we can restore um, or reconciliation. Can it be restoration of relationships? So if you have mm-hmm. a broken friendship, that kind of thing, you can restore that through reconciliation. Um, The action of making one view or belief compatible with another, sort of finding a middle ground, they would call that reconciliation. But also we talked about bookkeeping and reconciliation, reconciling accounts. So you're looking at your debits and your credits, and I don't have the quote that I was looking for, but it it basically uh, spoke to me about how Christ has reconciled for us because we have a debt so deep that mm-hmm. we can't pay through yeah. sin, okay. that then he's reconciled that for us. Similarly to what you're saying, right? right. Yeah. In reference to the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, we often, at least what I experience a lot, as how we need to be uh, reconciled to God. And, and it's, that's very true. But something that really stuck out uh, to me and reading those verses is God's desire to be reconciled to us. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, and I, and to think about it, that God takes the first step. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He sent his son to die on the cross to reconcile that debt. Right. He paid yeah. it. Yeah. And that, that to me just really touched me. You know, it's not what I can do, but it's what God has done, you know. It's the same concept. I often tell people this. Um, you know, you need to chase after God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you have to chase after God on this premise. And it's actually God chasing after you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, so it's not like that God has run down there and we're going, Hey, God, wake up. Mm-hmm. But God's actually chasing us. Yeah. And no other religion can say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good deal. Just... Stop running. Yes, just stop running. Right. I was just yeah. going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it reminded me of a conversation I had with somebody today about Adam and Eve, and of course, after they had eaten the forbidden fruit, they knew they were naked they, because they lost their innocence, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and in that loss of innocence, they hid from God. Mm-hmm. And of course, the Bible tells us that God went looking for them, mm-hmm. yeah. calling. Hey, Adam, where are you? Mm-hmm. And obviously he knew where he was. Mm-hmm. You know? This is a great point. So this reconciliation, God initiates it, and he chases after us. He reconcile, reconciles us through the ministry of his son, Jesus. Mm-hmm. And then he gives those who have been reconciled the ministry of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we become representatives or ambassadors for Jesus, for Christ. I heard Rabbi Zachariah on a video this week say this, if you had a cure for cancer, would you hide it? And would you say, well, I I don't really want to invade people's privacy. Everybody has a choice whether they want to die of cancer. Or would you say, no, I'd I'd shout it from the rooftops, right? Um, Why don't we do that with Jesus. We should be. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. It's funny because I used to work for a chiropractor, and at the time, 
I like they had they taught you all of your their philosophy and whatever so then I was just I, my life was changed by changed by it physically and mentally yeah. and whatever I felt better so then I go and tell everybody they called me the Cairo evangelist <laughs> <laughs> and he hired me he gave me a job out of it so but yeah. if that's what we did yeah. more of us did for God yeah right I find for myself when there's a product that I find that I really like for those who know me it's like look out because I'm gonna be out there yeah advertising yeah. wanting to sell yeah. it and I think the same should be for Jesus mm -hmm. um, just asking Holy Spirit though to direct us mm -hmm. yeah you made a you made a comment about that talk about that mm -hmm. about sorry about uh, the involvement of the Holy Spirit oh yeah the, because yes the urgency has to be there because it's a matter of life and death right mm -hmm. but along this road that where you're sharing with people yeah. you're gonna run into different types of people yeah. so I know like I think about my work experience so you know, maybe you're going to run into someone who is grieving or they're going through a really tough time and, or maybe they've approached you and are asking you questions. This is the easiest way to witness, right? Yes. Um, or, you know, they're looking for answers or something, right? And you can share that. But if you are running into someone who um, doesn't think their kid has cancer, you know, they don't agree. Or, yeah. you know, I've used the illustration of their house is on fire. Well, they don't agree their house is on fire. So now, how, how are they receptive to what you have to say? Well, the Holy Spirit, we need Him to help us to speak the words that are going to be um, effective. effective. Because, yeah. um, you know, you've talked about empowered speech. Yeah. I've preached on that many times. Well, you know, the Bible says that you'll receive power to be my witnesses. And we need that to be sensitive yeah. to what it is because yeah. the Holy Spirit's going to do the convicting. Yeah. We just have to be a little a vessel or a vehicle yeah. just to yeah. usher that in where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, we want to be sensitive and, and make sure that we're gentle when we need to be and we're direct when we need to be. I find, I, I, I keep on telling myself this, and I, I, I know it up here, but it doesn't affect me as much here as I need it to, and that is the person that I, I feel to witness to, God loves them more than I do. Mm -hmm. God wants to bring them to himself more than I do, even if I'm a really good praying person. Yeah. Uh, you know, God wants them more than I do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we need to listen to the uh, I, I think Spirit. sometimes, too, we can be involved with people who are so hurt, they have so many walls up, that the only way we can reach them is to be a good neighbor, to yeah. do, you know, not necessarily our words, until those walls start coming down. Yeah. But there again, it's, okay, Holy Spirit, what should I be doing? Yes. Should I, I think one of the deterrents for us sharing our faith is, was interesting, because we're talking to your mom about this, the difference between living in uh, uh, Calgary, where your brother lives, mm -hmm. and here, and she said, even from the West to here, the pace of life is significantly different. It's, she said, the pace of life here is very fast. Mm -hmm. And life is just going, it's going a million miles an hour. Like, oh, I got to get the grocery, I got to get this, this, this. And you just, you get on this uh, treadmill of life, mm -hmm. and it's almost like a survival treadmill. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and it's like, well, I was going to witness to the gas guy, but milk's on sale yeah. And, no, oh, yeah. and, and I got to get home and I got to feed the kids because they got to go to skating and I got to walk the dog and I still brought I got a briefcase with work I got to get done before 10 o'clock because I need to get up tomorrow morning at 4 because I got to go to Detroit and that's people's lives yeah. right and I don't maybe that's not super um uh, that's what I want. Advantageous for sharing our faith, like slowing down enough to say, "Man, yeah. I'm here as an ambassador." <laughs> and another point is, sometimes we can get discouraged because, mm. I mean, if we start saying, "Well, how many people have I yeah. brought to salvation?" Yeah. That could be yeah. discouraging. Yeah. But it's important for us yeah. to remember that every believer plays a part. One plants. Yeah. One waters. Yeah. Mm. One that's bring. Good. One's yeah. uh, sees some growth, yeah. and God yeah. brings the increase. Yeah. And like, it's just like a relay race, right? Where, you know, everybody's running the race. You pass the baton to the next guy, the next guy. Only one guy is crossing the finish yes. line, but that's okay because yeah. everything... Yeah. That's a great point. Right? And we can, we can get in that, like, with yeah. people that we care about, family members and yeah. stuff. Yeah. 
we might not be the one to bring our brother or yeah. Yeah. to the Lord, but um, we play a small part and someone else is going to pick it up and God's working that all out. Mm-hmm. So we need to stay encouraged. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite songs is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I think if we keep our focus on Jesus and listen to his voice, we don't have to worry about judging what this person or that person Mm -hmm. is doing. We're looking to him, listening to his voice, and we can trust him to lead us, direct us, lead the person beside us, direct them. And as you said, we're all working together. Mm -hmm. I have this sneaking suspicion, and I hope as we... uh, done this lesson and we spent some time on this we're going to be preaching it on Sunday I think sharing your faith is a lot easier than we think it is Mm -hmm. and sometimes we've complicated it too much and we just need to be natural a good friend of mine (laughs) uh, he he got a job as a manager at the store uh, and he'd been there for, I don't know, a week or so. And one of his employees came in and was really upset about something. I forget what. So my friend Dan looked at her and said, may I pray with you about that? She said, absolutely. So she closed her eyes and he prayed. He says, amen. And she looks at her, looks at my buddy Dan and says this, can we do this every morning? <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. um, not a believer. Mm-hmm. Not a tr- so I, I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a lot easier than we're thinking it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know? Isn't it really just our testimony? Yeah. Our yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Telling our story. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, before we run out of time, <laughs> I want to talk uh, about our reinvention here at Lifehouse because it will help bring this peace in. Mm -hmm. Uh, In our reinvention, we have five teams. Jim's going to list the five and give a brief, just a one sentence definition of each. Mm -hmm. And um, we believe that everybody will have a propensity for one of these teams. So here is our five teams there. Well, we have our Genesis team and it's apostolic by nature. Uh, It would be a visionary, there would be the group that sees the big picture. Uh, our next team would be uh, the hospitality team, and that would be more or more of a, a pastor-like nature, uh, ministering to the body of Christ, preserving, striving for unity in the body, pastoral care, and that sort of thing. Our next team would be the development team, which would be the teacher, and that would be focused on developing programs to teach doctrine, uh, Sunday school, children's church, etc. And then we have our encounter team, which is probably a more prophetic team. And that is a focus on doing just that, helping people to encounter God, to experience God. Uh, That could be prayer meetings, worship, etc. And uh, the last team that's probably the one that is our weakest team is actually our reach team, and that's the evangelistic nature that the church should take on, and that is presenting what we know inside the walls, carrying it outside the walls into the streets. Which brings me to ask the question, well, why do you think it's the weakest team, or weakest link in the chain? Or Yeah, I, th- I think it's our weakest uh, part because it typically happens outside of the church walls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes. Like we're very comfortable inside the church wall, yeah. so this takes us out of our comfort zone. I even just think about, like, if there's someone new that comes into the church, I, you know, that's say, you know, in my age range or something, I probably would introduce myself and say, hey, yeah. how's it going? But I'm probably not going up to random people at Walmart and being yeah. so friendly. <laughs> so it's just, it's a challenge yeah. to get out of that comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you'll find this statistically that. Most people are coming to faith through friends, mm-hmm. not not on the street randomly. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. I actually and, had um, someone say to me directly, "How do I find a church that believes exactly what you believe or what you talk about on your Facebook?" Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I thought, cool. isn't that interesting? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. That 
you know, she's obviously had a negative experience at some point, yeah, right. and it's going to be through these yeah. direct connections yeah. that the church can can have an effect on people. Yeah. The other super interesting um, statistic, and this is a st- this I can't give you the number, but I can give you the concept of the statistic that um, a very high percentage, like eighty-ish percent of people, um, uh, have a significant. Um, spiritual experience, maybe not new birth, but a significant spiritual experience prior to, prior to age 12, right? So, I, and I could ask her on a circle, mm-hmm. like, true? Mm-hmm. Yeah. True? True? Mm-hmm. true? Definitely. Yep. See, all of us. Mm-hmm. Like, didn't necessarily, now most of us may have been, may have been converted then, I'm not sure that you were, no. but um, all had a, a really significant, and um, which, not to get off on this track, but then we have to ask ourselves a question as people is how how uh, how much effort are we giving to evangelism of young people? Okay, before we run out of time, I, I'm going to have read, and Monique's going to read this, uh, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Okay, this is the NIV. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You're all young, significantly younger than me. Well, you know, you're not than <laughs> Yeah, you are. <laughs> Do you ever think about what it's like to die? Probably. And do you ever think, if I'm dying and I have the opportunity, what's the last thing I would say? And I've actually thought about that. Mm-hmm. If my family's around me, what's the last thing I would say? Mm-hmm. And here, Matthew gives us the last thing Jesus says. Mm -hmm. Mm. Go! Mm -hmm. Go! Mm -hmm. And be my ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Thank you for tuning in today and uh, being part of our set series. We are ambassadors for Jesus. Uh, He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to tell this world that Jesus has come to reconcile us to the Father that we might enjoy his presence in our heart and in our lives. Thank you for watching.